Good morning. My name is Elisa Laurel, Program Manager for the Western Riverside Council of Governments, otherwise known as WRCOG. And thank you so much for joining the very first episode of our Future Forward series. I know this might look a little bit different from the webinars that you're used to. Um, this is meant to be very much like a broadcast. Uh, so it's going to be a little bit different in, in how we do things. Um, we're going to be focusing on the presentation first and then having Q&A towards the very end. So I couldn't help but notice that we had quite a few registrants for this particular um, episode. And we're thankful and honored that you can join us, but uh, kind of thought also some of you might be a little bit unfamiliar with the work that we do here at WRCOG or who we are in general. Um, and so I thought I might give a little bit of background. We at WRCOG serve as a regional agency that focuses on our local jurisdictions within the Western Riverside County area. We aim to help many of our member jurisdictions in the subregion through a number of innovative programs in the areas of transportation, planning, um, energy, environment, and conservation, just to name a few. And so we're very honored to continue that work through avenues such as our Future Forward series, um, which essentially is a virtual broadcast brought to you on a monthly basis focus on innovating through disruption um, and meant to bring meaningful information to you uh, during this, these challenging, challenging times. Um, and so before we get started today, I wanted to jump into thanking our sponsors, our in-kind sponsors for supporting the launch of our very first episode. A big shout out and thank you to the Inland Empire Regional Chamber of Commerce and the Southern California Association of Governments. Thank you so much, you guys, for your support in helping us launch the very first episode and launching the series overall. Uh, so I also couldn't help but notice that we had quite a few elected officials uh, registered for this particular webcast. And um, I wanna first and foremost, thank you guys for your dedication to public service. Now more than ever, of course, leadership is critical and we thank you for your um, dedication to our communities. And we hope that the information that we share today helps to aid in your efforts as we navigate through these challenging times. So um, additionally, I wanna set some housekeeping rules for you guys. Um, you may have noticed a QR code has appeared or continues to appear in the corner of the screen. And I'm going to strategically point to this section. I think it's probably gonna appear here due to the magic of digital television. Um, you're gonna to wanna to take your cell phone and you wanna scan that QR code um, and if you can't get into that by scanning, you can visit slido.com. That's S-L-I-D-O dot com. And you can enter the uh, password, which is forward spelled F-O-R-W-A-R-D. So again, you wanna make sure you scan that QR code that's appearing in the corner of the screen. And um, you can go ahead and submit your questions through that platform. Now you can either choose to submit your questions anonymously or you can choose to reveal yourself by simply entering in your name, no judgment here. So without further ado, I'm excited to present the very first episode of the series. Um, and today's broadcast focuses on the near-term fiscal impacts of COVID-19. Um, for many of our jurisdictions within the Western Riverside County area and a general overlook um, in terms of what's happening in the Inland Empire area as well too. And so the COVID-19 crisis, as we all know, has been a challenging one. Um, it's had many broad scale impacts on nearly every facet of life. And so including, of course, the economic stability of our, of our region. So without further ado, I'm so excited to present our very first presenter for both this episode and the series. Um, introducing to you guys, esteemed economist Taifian Rice Evans, Managing Principal at Economic Planning Systems, Inc. And um, he will be sharing his analysis with you guys today. Taifian, turning it over to you. Well, thank you, Elisa. Good morning, everyone. I'm Taifian Rice Evans with Economic and Planning Systems, and I'm very pleased to be here today to present to you on an important topic. My presentation is divided into seven different sections. The first two are more introductory. They're going to talk a little bit about COVID-19 and the economy, about uncertainty and control. Then, then going to move into the issue of where we stood as an, as an economy, as a regional economy, the Inland Empire, uh, prior to COVID. Um, and then we're going to get a little bit more into the uh, some metrics. We're going to look at economic vulnerabilities and fiscal vulnerabilities in Western Riverside County. 
Um, and then we're going to move a little bit into the scenarios and forecasts, thinking about what the future may hold, and finally have a brief discussion about implications. So COVID-19 and the economy. I think it's fair to say that the impact of COVID-19 has been unique and universal. COVID-19 has affected every state in the, in the nation. It has affected all nations in the world. There's been no escaping the virus and its impacts. The relative ease of transfer and the difficulty to detect the virus have made social distancing, stay at home, shelter in place orders necessary. This is, this is struck at the heart of the economy. A large and immediate impact has been felt um, with unprecedented loss and drop in production and loss of jobs, unprecedented in the last 100 years. Human interaction is critical to pretty much all economic activity. As a result, social distancing has affected our economy in fundamental ways. It restricts access to the physical spaces where most goods and services are produced and consumed. By limiting economic activity, it reduces business and household income, creating a downward ripple effect on spending and incomes. And because about 70% of US GDP is directly tied to consumer spending, about 20% of which is discretionary, when we tell people to stay home, it means they can't spend money, or at least nearly as much money as they did, having direct impacts on many sectors of our economy. And finally, due to the interconnected ecosystem that is our economy, um, halts in production in one sector create supply chain and product production challenges in others. So I want to touch a little bit on, on uncertainty and control. I think we all crave, and I certainly do crave, more clarity, more certainty in uncertain times, but I don't think it's unfair to say that uncertainty is the only certainty. The path of the pandemic and the public health crisis are uncertain, the duration of stay-at-home orders and any relapses are uncertain, and the economic and fiscal future that we have is directly tied to these uncertainties. The economic recovery that we're hoping for will depend on the length and severity of the public health threat. Health models vary in terms of spread, duration, and fatalities, and so leave us with some more uncertainty about exactly how that plays out. We do recognize there's the potential for an economic bounce back if the virus can be neutralized quickly. We also recognize that full recovery might take a while and may not occur until a vaccine or remedy is available. Structural damage to the economy is much more likely the longer our behavior and movements are limited. So we'll have to see how that plays out. And we recognize the desire to open up the economy may well lead to experimental adjustments and social distancing and sheltering in place as we see infections rise and, and fall. And we'll talk more about potential timeframes for recovery and forecasting in a subsequent session. In terms of control, I think it's important we also recognize that much is outside the hands of local governments. Um, the evolution of the virus and even its control are both, uh, both a combination of medical conditions uh, and medical challenges um, that local governments can't directly affect. The federal and state governments are important players in this, um, the pathway of the pandemic both in terms of issuing guidances to us all, but also in terms of the federal stimulus packages they've issued today that may issue in the future. And finally, of course, individual household behavior and decisions are hard to predict um, in these circumstances. So, given all that, where did we stand as an economy uh, prior to COVID-19? On a broader note, I think it's fair to say that we were in the midst of arguably a fifth industrial revolution, an age of automation, e-commerce and autonomous vehicles. We saw this um, in a number of trends that have been affecting our lives over at least the last 10 years, the rise of e-commerce and the internet of things, attraction of brick and mortar retail, new types of jobs lost to automation, continued globalization and intersection of supply chains, strong international competition for manufacturing, fast growth and large demand for logistics centers, and a search by households, an ongoing search by households for high quality, a high quality of life and affordable housing, especially in California. 
When we look at the job makeup of the Inland Empire, we see that as, as of February 2020, there are about 1.55 million jobs spread across a number of sectors. Strong concentrations in retail trade, leisure and hospitality, transportation and warehousing, and many others. We also wanted to look at a time series trajectory of jobs and the economy of the Inland Empire to get a sense of the effects of the last um, and so-called Great Recession. This recession was especially painful and especially, um, uh, I think, especially painful um, in, in the Inland Empire, as well as um, certain other locations in California and elsewhere. And what you can see here is a substantial and deep uh, recessionary period. As we note, the recovery to get back to the number of jobs we were at before was a long one. It took from 2011 to 2015 to return to those levels. Um, but beyond that, we did continue to grow. We are now, at least pre-COVID, we're at a point of um, a long recovery and a substantial um, gain in jobs. We also wanted to look at two sectors, retail and logistics, because we think they're both um, been faring differently, and we expect those trends may be accelerated by COVID-19. In terms of retail, we saw that they had the, the same impact during the recession and loss of jobs, but we saw a slower overall recovery compared to the, over the total inland empire industry sectors really taking through 2016 to regain the jobs lost in the Great Recession, um, and in total only adding 7% of the growth um, in jobs as part of the recovery, despite the large size of that sector. In terms of logistics, the story is almost the opposite. Very modest um, losses that were quickly regained um, during the Great Recession, followed by several years of robust growth and a contribution to the overall um, set of recovered jobs of about 25%. Finally, on where we stood, uh, Dr. John Husing with Economics and Politics, a common uh, writer on the Inland Empire economy, has pointed out in his pre-COVID report, there were several positive trends in play. Inland Empire job growth was strong, unemployment rates were low, poverty levels were falling with job creation, Growth in professional service jobs, as well as logistics and other jobs, uh, were being seen. And there were also issues being worked on, as he noted. Um, the expansion of the job base, changing the jobs housing balance, the retention um, and provision of jobs, of middle class jobs, enhancing adult educational entertainment, and addressing housing affordability were all issues that needed to be grappled with um, and are, um, I think, at the front of many policymakers' minds. Changing um, direction a little bit here, we want to turn to a little bit more the analytical portion of our presentation and talk to you a little bit about economic vulnerability and fiscal vulnerability. On economic vulnerability, we first wanted to acknowledge that there have been huge economic losses. The impact has been immediate. I feel like the best statistic we have is the 26 million new unemployment benefit claims um, arose uh, in the five weeks to April 23rd, 2020, a remarkable number in such a short period of time. This is a pace of job loss and unemployment um, claims far higher than any other uh, recession in the last 100 years. In the Inland Empire, um, data is, we're still waiting for new data to come in, but we do know that between mid-February and mid-March, uh, the rate of unemployment increased by about 1%. And that was um, even before, or well before, the main impacts of stay at home and social distancing. In terms of measures of vulnerability, uh, we've looked at a lot of great studies at the national level um, that are basically divided into three groups. Some of them have looked at high risk occupations, some of them have identified jobs in high risk industries, and other have focused on a, on a more kind of blended approach looking at the ability to work from home as the key metric. Uh, for our work here uh, with WR Cog and, and in Western Riverside County, uh, we applied these high industry, we applied the high industry approach and focused on industry sectors and subsectors where social proximity is required. So we looked at leisure and hospitality, 
um, retail trade and selected services um, as the high risk categories. On this slide, you can see the um, you can see some of the initial results, both for Western Riverside, Inland Empire, and California. In California, on average, we see about 24% of jobs in these high-risk categories. The Inland Empire is a little bit higher at 26%. And in the WR COG, uh, Western Riverside County region, it's even higher at 34%. Of course, not all of these jobs will be lost. They are jobs that are in industries that are at more risk than others. When we look at the breakdown here, you can see that the main contributors to those high-risk numbers are in the retail trade sector, the food services and drinks, drinking places sector, and to a lesser extent, accommodation and the other services. Uh, what stands out here, in particular, in terms of the differences between California as a whole, the Inland Empire, and Western Riverside County, is the difference on the retail side, where Western Riverside County's 18% share of jobs in retail trade is substantially higher than it is in the other, um, other areas. Applying this same metric um, to the jurisdictional level in Western Riverside County, we can see variations, we see differences. Um, you can see there a range from 19% of jobs being vulnerable in Canyon Lake, up to 51% in the city of Paris. Showing more detail on those jobs at risk, here we can see the breakdown by city, um, by industry sector. You can see that retail trade um, plays a large part in those accumulative risk factors. Uh, food services and drinking places also varies and plays an important role. And in some jurisdictions, accommodation um, is also a substantial contributor. Okay. Shifting over now to fiscal vulnerability, I think it's important to note that it is very likely that there will be losses. Indeed, there have been losses already, and there will be disruptions. Um, it's, it's a broad, there's a, obviously a broad set of revenues and, and, and expenses uh, for government operations and municipal, municipal budgets. Um, here, I just want to note that in the ongoing government operations side of things, we have general fund revenues, an important source of funding. That's the area we'll be focus, focusing on analytically here, but we also recognize that gas taxes, enterprise funds will be affected. There have been additional expenditures on, due to COVID-19 responses at the local level, and there are also some real possibilities of pension fund performance um, implications due to um, rates of return in the stock market. On the side of infrastructure and capital improvement financing, uh, we know that development impact fees are an important source of funding for a lot of our key infrastructure and public improvements. Uh, we'll have to see what effect there is on future on the future pace of development, um, but we need to recognize that to the extent that a new development starts to fall off, those important revenues will also fall too. We also expect that it'll be harder to employ at this time mechanisms such as land secured financing. Um, through CFDs, and we do also expect disruptions in the municipal bond market, leading to postponements or more complexity around bond issuances. So turning to fiscal vulnerability indicators, um, we know that the state Department of Tax and Fee Administration provides some very helpful data on tax revenues um, collected by cities. So we're able to uh, establish and obtain that database for the 482 cities in California and use that to take a look or take a close look at uh, different revenues into the city's general fund. Uh, there's a series of revenues, um, the most prominent ones noted here, that, that make up um, the large majority or a substantial majority of general fund revenues. And what we did here for in our vulnerability indicator was to say, okay, sales and use taxes on retail outlets and transient occupancy taxes on hotels and the like are the two vulnerable categories. So let's look at that, that through the lens of the vulnerability uh, metric. Here you can see some results. You can see in California, about 28% on average, um, California cities, about 28% of revenues comes from sales and use tax, from retail trade, combined with TOT taxes. It's higher in the Inland Empire at 35% and equally high in Western Riverside County 
task, 35%. Here you see a breakdown of that, um, showing some interesting variations. You can see at the bottom right there, the high-risk revenues of um, in California. We have a lower number, 18% for the sales tax revenues on retail trade, substantially lower than the equivalent 28% of the inland empire, and, the, and even lower than uh, the 33% that we see um, the importance of retail, um, retail trail sales tax dollars in Western Riverside County. We also noticed the reverse trend uh, in terms of TOT taxes, the average in California are about 9%, uh, the average a little bit less in the Inland Empire, 7%, and much lower in Western Riverside County at 3%. Uh, we also looked at it again through the lens of Western, Western Riverside County jurisdictions, and here you can see uh, this, the dispersion of cities um, and the different fiscal vulnerabilities we, we have in our cities in Western Riverside County, ranging from a low of 5% to a high of 49%. Placed in another context, we can see here the impact on a per capita basis, taking into account the number of persons living in the city. And there again, you can see there are several cities that have averages below that of state and the Inland Empire. We also see several that have numbers above. As a caveat, I do want to note that some of those cities, like the city of Riverside, that have numbers above the average, that is in part because they passed additional sales tax measures um, to support public safety and other services, and so have a higher, uh, higher rate of, of sales tax. Okay, so now I want to talk about scenarios and forecasts, and given all the uncertainty that I was talking about earlier, um, you know, I think these should be considered to be kind of educated guesses and thoughts. Before I get into some of what we, we think and we see in the way of economic fluctuations and fiscal fluctuations, I do want to point out that I think for many jurisdictions, and I'm sure many in Western Riverside County, um, you know, city managers, budget directors, finance directors are carefully assessing and reviewing any, the information they can get on the impacts of COVID-19 and how it might change uh, what they are able to do and how they must plan in the future. And so here's a few, and what, what I've done here is basically just show you on the first line of each of them, the level of loss projected or now expected for the rest of this fiscal year. So it's important to note that, for example, in the case of the city of Los Angeles, they're expecting a loss of $234 million. This is in all, all different kinds of revenues coming in. Um, in the remainder of this financial, fiscal or financial year, which is really just a you know three three or four months to a relatively small amount of time. The second line shows you what is expected over the course of the next year. And as you can see, in some cases, certainly in LA, they, they gave an average recognizing the uncertainties. But this is these are losses over the course of a longer period of 12 months. Uh, the city of Sacramento is another example, um, is now planning around a $30 million loss in this current but current year budget and planning for a $60 million loss. 50 million loss for the next financial year. And finally, San Diego, following roughly similar kind of relationships. Um, it looks like between losses this year and next year, expects 110 million or so this year and 145 million in the next financial year. Okay, so stepping back a little bit just into the, um, the world of recessions and recoveries, I think it is important to note um, that downturns vary by depth and duration and by the pace of their recovery. It's very natural to look to prior downturns and recessions for clues, um, but what we often find when we do that is they're all unique. The Great Recession, which is the one that is kind of, I think, burnt most strongly into many of our um, memories, was unique in its origins, its threat to the whole financial system, and the way it started. Uh, there have been over, uh, over 10 other recessions since the Great Depression, and they've all been different um, in their own way. And I think it, it, even, even more than the differences between those recessions, I think it's fair to say that COVID-19 is a different kind of downturn. Um, as I mentioned, uh, the fact that it's medically driven by a public health crisis has resulted in the sharpest and fastest downturn we've seen in 100 years. So that, 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 that includes the Great Depression. Not the result of economic causes. Our job losses have been immediate. And the path from here, at least initially, is not really dependent on economic factors, but is more dependent on public health, uh, pandemic and medical options and responses. I think as we think about the future and read different uh, commentators and forecasters, 
Um, what we see is there is agreement that we are in a period of uh, intensive loss of jobs and economic production that has been sharp, and that we are, and that is as is normal. Uh, losses in municipal revenues follow these follow these losses, and those have begun and will also continue while we're in this downturn period. I think it's also agreed that associated with that loss in economic production are there are ongoing painful losses um, in income to households and revenues to businesses that then further multiply through our economy until we can get back to work. What is not agreed upon um, is the length of the downturn and the pace of the recovery. I want to quickly just talk to you about the two, I think, whether they're the most common or the most um, distinct types of scenarios that have been articulated, um, and I think, you know, form the basis for some potential forecasting. Uh, the first one, which, which I consider to be the best case scenario, is, is the V scenario, and you'll, you'll notice there's a lot of letters involved here, the V, the U, and the W being the shapes of, of kind of GDP growth um, in, in the future in a simplified manner. Under the best case scenario, um, the concept is we will have, we've had a fast fall, but we can have a quick reco recovery. Uh, this does assume that US infections um, you know, do plateau and that we can all return to work safely and that return can be safely managed without a, a resurgence of the virus. It does recognize the underlying strength of the US economy with which we en into which we entered um, this moment and also the scale of the stimulus, the federal, federal stimulus um, is substantial in size in terms of the U.S. economy. And, um, and of course, it envisions a more limited structural damage to the economy due to the fast return. I want to note that a recent paper by Christopher Thornburg of Beacon Economics and the University of California at Riverside Business and Forecasting Center uh, made a strong argument for why, um, why this was a real possibility recognizing the unknowns out there. The other alternative scenario that um, many others have written about and shows up in most lists of potential outcomes is, is the U or potentially the W, which is effectively, um, well, the U, first of all, which is a fast fall and gradual recovery. The W part of it is it presumes some level of re-social distancing, so we have a bumpy return to normal. It does assume difficulties in combat combating the virus, leading to slower return to normal. Um, it does know structural problems and expect structural problems to emerge. The downturn becomes officially designated as a recession. Um, though there are different perspectives within this particular scenario, there is also room for pessimism and optimism in terms of how long the U lasts and whether it looks like a typical U or more like a bathtub. So we turn this into... Um, just to, to do a little, provide a little bit of analytics here, we turn this into a, um, an illustrative uh, diagram, if you will. Here, what you're looking at is the orange line really is the V with the sharp fall in the second quarter of um, 2020, but then a pretty quick recovery um, in the third quarter and almost a complete recovery by the end of the fourth quarter of 2020. The U, on the other hand, being the more um, pessimistic um, and, uh, option, is more drawn out. We 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 maintain a kind of low and um, you know depressed level of output through the third quarter. It's only really in the fourth quarter we start to slowly and gradually recover, um, taking us perhaps to the middle of 2021 before we have recovered. We did some thinking on those on those two trajectories, and and kind of building on a lot of the work that's been done by um, by others, including. Um, card sale information, uh, Department of Commerce data, uh, retail sales, uh, and other other forms of um, other folks who tracks track tax um, uh, sales tax and other tax revenues. We came up with this as an initial forecasting kind of method, if you will, or illustration for the optimistic and alternative scenarios. And as you'll note, um, in the in the second half of financial year 2019 to 2020. Um, we, we, did, we did not distinguish between optimistic and alternative. In both cases, we expect a hit to retail, a substantial hit to a retail sales tax and a very substantial hit to TOT revenues. We do start to diverge then as we get into the um, 2020 to 2021 um, financial year in terms of the pace of the recovery. Um, again, in the optimistic scenario, we do still take some hit in the second half. Um, 
we do, I'm sorry, we do still take some hit at the beginning of 2020, 2021, 2021 fiscal year, it dissolves quickly. Whereas in the alternative scenario, we continue to see substantial losses um, throughout the um, that financial year, but with the recovery only really coming at the end of that. Okay, so thinking about the future implications, we wanted to give you some initial thoughts. Uh, there's a lot more thinking to be done on this, but we wanted to provide you with some initial thoughts on what this might all mean. I think there's some immediate questions that we're all asking. How long will this last? How do we make it through this? We know that businesses are asking, when can I open up again? Well, when will my customers return? Um, what about my stimulus funding to keep me going? Will I have to change the way I produce goods um, once we return to work? You know, households have similar questions. When can I return to work? Will my job still be available? When can my kids go back to school? When will my stimulus check arrive? And cities also have questions. How do we support our communities? How do we provide essential services? What do we do in the face of falling revenues and increasing costs? What about federal stimulus dollars? Are they going to be available to us? And how can we manage the current situation, but also avoid moving backwards and undoing all the recent good work and progress that we've made? I think structurally, in terms of the lo a larger question that goes beyond the immediate, we ask ourselves, will there be longer term structural impacts from this pandemic? Is there a new normal? And I wanna answer that in, in, in two parts. I think what's most expected or expected to come out of this is that the pandemic will accelerate the technology-driven patterns, emerging patterns of work and consumption that we spoke about earlier, part of that kind of fifth industrial revolution shift, the way we do things. And we do expect in, in the Inland Empire and elsewhere, we will see an increased push for work and telecommunicating, uh, just a continued rise in e-commerce, um, and ordering online, um, clicking and collecting, curbside pickup, all those kinds of things. And we also imagine that as we've learned, many of us have learned to obtain new services, both the traditional, both I guess the, the Netflix style on-demand content services, but also other services like online learning. We've all had to dabble in those in the recent weeks and we will see a continued rise in them as well. I think what's more uncertain is whether this pandemic causes major shifts in our lifestyles, cities and economies. Um, if the pandemic lasts a long time, if we see pandemics returning in different forms, I think this will push people to rethink some of the way they, they want to do things. Uh, so on the consumer preference side, we could see a preference for more remote living. This could affect the way in which the kind of housing we choose to live in, kind of workspaces we're willing to live in, the way in which we de design our cities relative to downtowns and the like, and the kinds of transportation um, we're willing to ride, uh, including public transit. Uh, we also need to think about some of the larger effects, the geopolitical um, effects of this, which, again, may, may, may be enduring and may, may be um, just a continuation of past trends. But will we, will we see a change in the levels of globalization? Will we see some folks trying to break supply chain connections uh, because they don't want to be dependent on other countries? Will we see attitudes change towards international travel and immigration, all big questions and uncertainties. And finally, the role of governments. I think that the um, state, federal government, and local governments as well are playing a large role in, help, in trying to help manage the situation and see us all through it. And you know, whether or not that changes um, anyone's perceptions of government and that their sense of their role of, in crises, I think will be an interesting um, trend to watch as we come out of the COVID era. Um, you know, in terms of just the Western Riverside County in particular, um, tying these things together, as I mentioned, we do think that we'll see this continued and accelerated shift in the economy I spoke about earlier. I do think that the retail trade, retail stores will continue to be challenged. Uh, we do expect continued demand for e-commerce related activities, the logistics centers we're seeing, as well as the rise of last mile distribution centers, um, gig economy workers and the like. And we, will, we do assume and expect that there'll be continued, continued trends of automation, and increasing demand for high-level, um, high-skill jobs, as well as low-skill, low-wage low jobs, and that continued hollowing out of the middle class that has been particularly difficult um, over these last um, few decades. In terms of policies we should pursue post-pandemic, 
Um, you know, I think we'll have to, everyone has to see how this plays out. But without major structural changes in our attitudes and the way in which we think we see ourselves living, I think in general, based on what I've seen of the policies that are in place right now or the policy conversations that are going on right now in the, in, in the inland empire, I think it makes a lot of sense to stay the course generally, to continue to focus on expanding the job base and reducing their jobs, housing imbalance and all that commuting to attracting businesses that are providing higher paying jobs, building the innovation economy, enhancing adult education, you know, investing in our critical infrastructure and working on quality of life issues, both for existing residents, but also to attract skilled labor force. And of course, other issues that have emerged too, like working on, the digital divide that has become more, I think, noticeable in these last few weeks. Finally, I want to note um, some thoughts on the immediate and building fiscal challenges. Um, and it's never easy to grapple with, um, you know, cutting budgets. And there are, in reality, no easy short-term choices. On a broader note, and there's certainly more to be done in the way of thinking. Um, you know, I'm writing an analysis on this front, but on a broader thought. Broad to note, we think that um, the community should respond to immediate impacts and realities, but try to keep an eye um, or part of an eye on the future. Um, we, we need to recognize and expect immediate and short-term losses in revenues and adjust accordingly. Like many cities are already doing, we need to use our funds that we have strategically and um, use our staff strategically, um, given some of the, the, the different needs we have of staff at this point in time. We do need to apply for stimulus funds where possible. And I do believe that some funding is now being made available um, for smaller cities. Um, so that was a small sign of hope. But I think we also need to recognize um, the limited control and limited influence local government actions can have on broader economic conditions. As I mentioned earlier, uh, many, many of the things that cause this crisis were outside, well, outside of the control of local governments. And as long as we have this major kind of stay at home um, situation, I think some of the traditional tools we, we, um, we look to to try to tweak and fix on our economy aren't gonna make a difference until we really have a change in conditions. And finally, I encourage us all, as I mentioned earlier, while we're working through this particular crisis to keep an eye on re-emergence and the longer term goals because the long term or the medium term uh, will come and it's important that we try to manage our current crisis with an idea to minimizing the impacts on the future as well. And that is the end of my presentation. So we're now gonna to go to our Q&A uh, session. Before we do, I just wanted to um, point you to this slide um, that mentions the uh, our company, Economic and Planning Systems. Uh, we are a California-based um, consulting firm uh, grappling with the issues of economics, real estate, and public finance at the local and uh, regional levels. We have offices in Oakland, Sacramento, and Los Angeles, as well as in De Denver, Colorado, and we would welcome any uh, inquiries or, or follow-up questions on our presentation. And Elisa, I think that's now back over to you. Thank you, Taifian, for that dynamic presentation. We will now be turning it over to the Q&A portion of our broadcast for the episode. Uh, and as I indicated in the very beginning of this presentation, you're gonna wanna go ahead and take your cell phone and um, scan the QR code in the corner of the screen. And I'm gonna erroneously point here because I think that's where it's gonna appear if you do the magic of digital television. So you're gonna take your cell phone and open the camera app and it should lead you to slido.com. If it doesn't do that, go ahead and just directly go to slido.com, spelled S-L-I-D-O.com. And it's going to take you to where you're probably going to have to enter a event code. And that event code is forward, spelled F-O-R-W-A-R-D. Again, F-O-R-W-A-R-D. And uh, you can go ahead and submit your name if you want to go ahead and submit your name. Or you can choose to submit a question anonymously. Um, and we're going to go ahead and moderate questions through that platform. So uh, while we get the questions teed up on screen, I'm going to go ahead and introduce our Director of Transportation and Planning, Chris Gray, and back to the broadcast stage, Taifian Rice-Evans, who will be doing your questions. So Chris will be reading the questions, and Taifian. Uh, I think you have some questions to ask. Yes. Um, thank you, Elisa. 
I'm going to go ahead and read the questions on a first come first serve basis. I'll be reading the question, then asking Typhoon to answer them. Uh, but before we do that, I wanted to just share with every remind everyone we have an online poll. Uh, we're asking you whether you're optimistic or pessimistic about the WR Cog economic outlook heading into 2021. So far, we have a majority for optimism, but I encourage you all to participate in the poll. Uh, with that, Typhoon, I want to uh, pose the first question to you. Um, we keep hearing bad economic news, such as record numbers of people unemployed. How can we have any optimism about the situation? And many read every day in the newspapers are indeed bad. We've, we've been hit hard and hit quickly. I will say that this is different from other recessions that we've seen. Um, the economic fundamentals going into this recession or downturn uh, were, were very strong. This, this downturn is not caused by uh, economic factors, but more by this pandemic and virus. So there's a real possibility, obviously with uncertainties thrown in, that we could see um, a reopening. If we are able to successfully reopen the economy um, in a safe way, we could see a bounce back without too much structural damage uh, faster than I think some of us might instinctively expect. So what advice can we can, can you we give, can to you those give to those early. still early in their career or about to start their job search? That's a great question. And um, it's probably a lot of other people on the uh, on the platform here who, who have good good guidance for you as well. Um, what I can say is, uh, you know, as a business owner and someone who's worked through um, some recessions, I think that the A, obviously, it's a difficult time to be entering. Uh, the market, but B, what I have seen to be most successful, and I think this is true of the way in which cities, households, and businesses, frankly, have to operate right right now, is there needs to be a little bit more hustle. There needs to be a little bit more innovation. Um, you need to look for opportunities in places where you didn't necessarily think uh, you would be looking. Um, internships and the like can be very important as a way of discovering and finding new pathways forward. And that's certainly a lot of the folks that we hired during the last recession, you know, that they, they came to us with slightly different resumes than we were expecting, um, but were able to, you know, prove to us both a broader set of interests and a desire, the ability to um, get things done. Okay. Okay. Um, this is a question from uh, Westby, council member from the city of Corona. We are currently in stage one of the governor's plan. How long can small businesses stay in the stage without permanent damage? The damage, as we know, um, to many small, small businesses, especially in the leisure and hospitality industries and the retail trade industries, um, are dramatic um, and substantial. I think many, many folks and many businesses are relying on where they can get it. They're relying on uh, small, small kind of operational uh, side businesses where they can do it. Um, that kind of system can only last so long. And I do be believe if, if, if the downturn goes on too long, we start to see in so on season other issues. Um, the hope is that with a, with, with the hope really is, I guess, springs around the virus, its trajectory and the pace in, pace in which we can start to reopen. You know, uh, reopenings are starting to happen. Um, we know there's questions about how quickly and how safely we can do that. But the hope is to at least get some uh, folks spending again, some of these businesses, so they can start um, in some ways filling some of the losses they've had, stay in business, and be, be there ready to uh, benefit when the rebound comes. Rebound okay. comes. Okay. Um, we have a couple of questions that are essentially about a, a stimulus so I'll, I'll combine a couple of those questions in the interest of time. Uh, regarding the potential uh, for a federal stimulus to, to local governments, uh, what order of magnitude do you think would be needed for a V-shaped recovery? Well, I would, first of all, I would say that the isn't completely dependent on the size of the stimulus. The stimulus is an important part of it. Um, a lot, you know, bigger than the stimulus really over uh, 
uh, vaccines, testing, and the like. Um, but I do, and I know earlier the uh, the scale of the federal stimulus has already been very substantial when we think about it in the in the in the nature of kind of gross domestic product. Um, so there's already been a substantial stimulus. I do think another stimulus package, um, and I know there've been several several on the order of some of the more recent ones in the you know 350 billion or so mark that would, presumably would you know as as they all do combat a number of different issues, but perhaps could go more directly and specifically. Uh, certainly to the smaller cities and public agencies that haven't seen any of that money yet, um, again, would be another way to really help everybody hold on uh, for these next few months, which will be bumpy, and for us to come back uh, more quickly and with less pain. Okay. Pain. If, pain. We have 26 million pe- if we have 26 million people unemployed nationally, how does the economy just reopen? We now have billions of households that are now behind financially. Yeah, I mean, I think that the we envision the economy reopening, um, you know, folks returning to restaurants, to travel, to more normal forms of, of, um, of spending. Uh, there will be demand. There will be great opportunities for businesses to do more sales and to employ, re-employ their workers. So I think the reopening of the economy part of it um, in theory, could be pretty smooth. The big along the way, have I lost touch? Did I lay off my workers and have, a lot, have I lost touch with them? Um, have I, um, are there other forms of you know, supply chain problems that now cause me to operate less efficiently? Um, and, 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 and the big question is, you know, can, can I op- operate at maximum capacity when I need to uh, use social distancing uh, methods, both in production and provision of my goods and services. Okay. And then, uh, type on another and question. Then, uh, type uh, on another question. Uh, what happens to the economy if there's a second COVID peak? I think, yeah, that's a great question. I think that the what what happens is perhaps some of that optimism that uh, those those uh, quite positive figures you were mentioning, uh, Chris, from the poll, where we were at perhaps sixty percent optimism, literally on a you know a small sample size here. I think that really starts to um, to crater. I think a lot of a lot of economists over the years have used expressions like animal spirits and irrational exuberance uh, to explain how the psychology, our psychologies individually and collectively, really affect uh, the economic cycle. And so I think that um, you know a, a, a hasty return and then hence another peak. I think would put us um, you know would destroy some of the optimism. I think many of us are feeling now. And definitely push us into that kind of U cycle, but probably a longer U, um, and and with even even perhaps perhaps you know greater implications. So that would be, I would say, um, a very bad signal for us all. Very bad all signal right. for us all. All right, um, Typhoon. I've I've got two more questions. Uh, I'm going to combine a couple of the questions. And the first one is, uh, in terms of small businesses, we know that a significant portion of our economic activity is really tied to small businesses. Um, what else can we do to help small businesses through uh, this downturn, and how might that differ based on the sector of the economy? So, for example, a retail small business versus a more service-oriented small business. Mm. That's a great question. I mean, I think one of the challenges in devising a federal stimulus program is that we needed a program that could go quickly and could get the money out to those in need quickly. Along the way. Uh, but there have been substantial levels of funding um, available for some. And I think that that, in some ways, is, is, is the key point, is if we can ensure that businesses have access, as some of these programs are designed to cover uh, their employees and their benefits for a couple of months, we can really um, help stave off um, some, of those, some of those worst impacts and some of the big structural impacts. I do think on a sector by sector basis, we do see, as, as we've spoken about a lot in this presentation, uh, retail trade, hospitality being hit really hard. Uh, we do see other co- you know, components of the industry, um, e-commerce, you know, online learning. There are a variety of tools that are on the up in this particular moment and maybe on the up um, beyond that. So to the extent that we can focus those monies on the places that need them most, 
um, that would be great. Though I think I, could, I also recognize that stimulus spending um, in any sector of the economy, because we're all so interrelated, actually has a multiplier effect. So we all benefit from stimulus provided wherever it may go. Um, Typhoon, I, I actually I've, I've got so I've got two more questions to ask you. The first one is uh, from Jason Scott, uh, from Jason from Scott the of, uh, from the city of Corona. Uh, are the governor's orders presently too stringent to to business? Would easing orders to to permit businesses to open sooner in cities with low case numbers be best? I'm not asking you to comment on the governor's proposal, but um, do you think an, an approach that uh, has nuances to it in terms of which businesses can open when economy? I do, I do, I do. I, do. I mean, I'm kind of both, I think like all of us, we're, we're both trying to judge between the being safe, safe, avoiding that resurgence we just spoke about, but also giving people some hope and also giving the economy a chance to reemerge. And so I do, th I do think there are real possibilities of doing that. Um, distinctly by um, by business, by type of business, and by type of location. You know, people, of course, you know, we're all free to move, and so we do need to be um, cognizant of continually tracking and testing. Um, I think that the governor's orders are, you know, obviously an important kind of uh, benchmark, and I do think that my sense is that there is a he, like the rest of us, are kind of making decisions um, periodically through time. And so my sense is that there may be some adjustments in those in, the, in, that, in that thinking or some changes in the way we, we go about things as we learn more. But certainly a, a, managed, a managed move towards reopening in a safe way, I think is what everybody is, is very much craving right now. All right. So Taifi, I'm gonna ask the, the final question, which is, a, it, it's specifically about resilience. Um, what can what advice can you offer us to help us be better prepared uh, economically? Should something like this or an event like this happen in the future? Yeah, that's a that's a great question, Chris. Well, I know many of us are focused on the on the here and now. Um, you know, I think I think some of it is about looking, and this is partly what I was hoping the economic vulnerability and um, fiscal vulnerability metrics would help us with is just to kind of look at areas of concentration, um, at least relative concentration, see where you have particular um, job clusters, and, and, and continue to think, and this is not an easy thing to do, but about job diversification, um, about a range of opportunities for um, our residents, for our workers. I think the more robust, um, the more robust and the more um, you know, interconnected our regional economy can be, I think the stronger and more resilient we can be, recognizing there will always be shocks um, that will, where certain sectors will be affected, and that I think will just be a part of our ongoing economic history. Great. Um, so, Typhion, in, in the interest of time, we're going to go ahead and uh, cut off the Q and A. We received some great questions, um, and we tried to get to as many as we could. Uh, so, thank you all for, uh, for the Q &A. so thank you all for for the Q and A. I did want to go ahead and just give a final report on the poll. So uh, on the question, do you feel optimistic or pessimistic about the state of the economy in the WCOG region heading into 2021? We have uh, optimistic at 68%, pessimistic. So uh, thank you all for participating in the poll. Um, and now turning it back over back to you, Elisa. Thank you, Taifian and Chris uh, for moderating those questions. I know we had some dynamic discussions. Um, so before we tune out, I just want to let you guys know, I um, want to thank you, first of all, for viewing our very first episode, supporting our very first episode as well. So thank you to the Inland Empire Regional Chamber of Commerce again and the Southern California Association of Governments. Uh, thank you to our in-kind sponsors for helping us promote the uh, episode today that we're all viewing. Uh, and in addition to that, some of you may have questions as to where you can access the presentation itself. Uh, we should be having a uh, link in the description box of the YouTube. Uh, you can go ahead and click on that link that will have the PDF presentation that Taifian presented on. In addition to that, we also plan to be sending a e-blast to all of the registrants later this afternoon. You'll be able to access the PDF registration, I'm sorry, you'll be able to access the PDF 
link there. And then in addition to that, um, the broadcast, the YouTube broadcast as well. So you can kind of go back and see if you miss any content, you can use that YouTube link to, to go back. Um, additionally, if you'd like to learn more about EPS uh, and the work that they do, you can check them out via the presentation that will be provided to you um, in the PowerPoint. Uh, and before we sign off, I want to let you guys know that we have another exciting broadcast coming up in May. It's going to be scheduled um, from 9 to 10 a.m. and again on May 28th. And uh, please be sure to join us for that broadcast. And we'll also be having a special teleconference broadcast event on June 25th. Uh, the teleconference broadcast will be from 9.30 a.m. to 2.30 p.m. So be on the lookout for marketing when that comes out. And uh, we're going to be actually producing some exciting panel presentations based on our special theme for that episode. And uh, the theme is a region at its tipping point. Uh, we'll be having dynamic discussions on talent, innovation, and place, TIP. So please stay tuned for more exciting content. And until then, uh, we look forward to having you guys continue to join us on this series. So thank you for joining us this morning and stay safe and stay healthy. Take care. Bye.